Members, we now move on to questions to Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. And again, for members benefit who may not have been in earlier, uh, the person who has listed the question will be offered a supplementary. If we are ahead of schedule near the end of the list, uh, others may have an opportunity for supplementary questions. I call Mark Durgan. Question number one. There have been no official statistics published yet for household recycling rates during this pandemic, and therefore I cannot definitively identify whether there has been a significant impact on the household recycling rate as compared to pre-COVID figures. Provisional information for household recycling during the quarter April to June will not be available until October 20. Unverified information from both councils and private waste companies suggests an increase in recycling at the curbside due to more people being at home. However, there has also been a correspondent, uh, corresponding reported increase in curbside residual wastes arising. Northern Ireland is already well positioned in terms of recycling. Prior to the COVID-19 crisis, the latest official statistics showed a provisional household recycling rate of 52.3% for the 12-month rolling period uh, up to December 31, uh, 2019. The EU2020 target of 50% waste from households recycling was also met during 2019. During the last decade, the household recycling rates have increased by 15 percentage points. In order to normalise recycling behaviours post-COVID and build on momentum for recycling observed in recent years, communications and capital funding initiatives are being delivered to assist with the recovery. I call Mark Durkin for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. As a former Environment Minister, one of my proudest achievements in that role was to get every school in Northern Ireland on the Eco Schools programme, the only place in the world to achieve that. However, we do have a bit of a problem in our schools in terms of where their waste goes, with some schools having no recycling facility whatsoever. This is environmentally damaging and a drain on public finance. Will the Minister work with his counterpart and colleague in education to ensure a better approach to waste disposal across our schools estate? I am quite happy to do that, and I will pass the question you have asked on to, to Minister Weir uh, and ask him for a response on it as well uh, in terms of following that up. Moving on, I call John Stewart. Mr. Deputy Speaker, question number two, please. Anticipate that a decision on the application for a marine construction licence for the Island McGee gas storage project could potentially be made in autumn 2020. It should be noted there are wider aspects to this project to be considered by other organisations, which I understand have still to be resolved. I call John Stewart for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer? The Minister will be aware that in making the decision on the marine licence, there um, will be a considerable amount of public safety and environmental impact concerns about this proposal in the local area, particularly in Island McGee and across East Antrim. Can I ask, has additional environmental information been requested from the developer, Infrastrata, and will this be subject to further public consultation? Well, obviously, the planning side of it lies with the Department for Infrastructure, and, and it is for them uh, to seek. Uh, further information um, of the developer, as and when required. <coughs> Excuse me. And I would assume that um, they will have been requesting information as issues arise. In terms of the role of my department, uh, it is to do with the environment, to do with marine uh, licensing. And I personally have stayed back from it until all of the information is available and a recommendation is made to me by the experts who are looking into it. Moving on, I call Pat Catney. Um, Minister, I was just trying to. Uh, uh, oh, question three. Sorry. At the end of the transition period, <coughs> the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol will come into effect, where Northern Ireland will remain aligned to the EU in certain rules. The challenge of having a fully operational regime agreed and in place by the end of this year remains significant. From 1 January, the greater the deviation between the UK and the EU in terms of trading arrangements, tariffs and SPS rules, the more difficult and intrusive the protocol becomes. Therefore, one of my key priorities is for the EU and UK to agree a zero tariff, zero quota limit deal, and to have maximum alignment in terms of SPS arrangements. I believe there is still time to achieve this, and it is in everyone's interest that we do. If there is no trade agreement between the UK and the EU, 
The implementation of the protocol becomes even more challenging. It is my aim to ensure that the Northern Ireland Protocol is implemented in a way that maximises the flow of trade and what works for Northern Ireland businesses and citizens in terms of agri-food. This means continued importation of animals, plant products and live animals into Northern Ireland from GB um, continues un- unconstrained um, across uh, uh, access for Northern Ireland's business to their key market in Great Britain. The Cabinet Office has published a command paper on the UK's approach to the Northern Ireland Protocol on 20 May. The paper sets out proposals on how UKG will operationalise the protocol and a four-point plan on it will be delivered. I welcome the commitments that have been made in the command paper and my department um, will continue to work uh, with the UKG cooperating on that basis. Call Pat, call Pat Catney for something. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister, for your questions so far, uh, for your answers so far. Uh, Minister, the agricultural sector was in time of great difficulty and uncertainty. Uh, even before this pandemic, surely you must agree that we must extend the transition period to allow some stability, after listening to what you have said, and uh, for some stability in the sector before the impact of Brexit? Well, I think uh, a lot of stability would come about if Michel Barnier uh, would lift this nonsense of an idea that we need export certificates to go from GB or, or NI to GB. And G- GB, the UK government, have made it clear that it's not something that they need, it's not something they wish, nor is it something they desire. And I would say to every party in this chamber that they all need to reject Mr. Barnier's suggestion that that is required because it will be damaging to every single business that is exporting to GB and it will be damaging consequently to their employees. So every party needs to respect the well-being of businesses and employees in Northern Ireland and say to Mr Barnier, there is no export health certificates required for the good food that is produced in Northern Ireland and exported um, to Great Britain. There hasn't been before. UK don't want it. We don't need it now. So why are you trying to force this upon Northern Ireland and damage Northern Ireland as a consequence? That would give businesses some surety. Order, order. Moving on, I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question four. Thank you. I and my officials have been in regular contact with industry representatives and stakeholders to assess the impact. I have been concerned about the serious threat to farm incomes due to falling farm gate prices in some sectors, due to the closure of markets in food service and hospitality, and the significant risk that this could pose to the existing existence of otherwise viable farm businesses. From factual monitoring of market data and farm gate prices, I was aware that losses had already occurred in the beef dairy, ornamental horticulture and spring lamb production sectors. I have since became aware of other issues in the seed sector related to the market for wool. The £25 million COVID support package will be targeted towards those businesses that have been hardest hit financially as a direct result of the pandemic. To that end, my officials are continuing to monitor the impact in all sectors, including the sheep sector, and are assessing the need for support as circumstances evolve. It is also important to note that I am still concerned about the longer-term market for livestock and the knock-on effect that the pandemic might have on farm gate prices later in the season, when more lambs are marketed and store lambs are sold. If market developments over coming weeks and months dictate that we need more funding, then I'll be going back to the executive to seek that additional support. I call Harry Harvey for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, so far. A significant proportion is exported via market to the Republic. Will the Department take market prices in the Republic into consideration when determining whether assistance is required? The period of, uh, the period of time that land prices <coughs> dipped quite badly was a shorter one than, than was the case for beef and, and, and dairy industries. Uh, and we're happy to look at all of the markets. Obviously, um, not all lambs um, that are going to slaughter um, are slaughtered in Northern Ireland quite a lot, are, are slaughtered in the Republic of Ireland, and consequently are sold in live markets. So that's an area that we will look up. Moving on, I call Paula Bradley. Thank you. Question five. My department continually monitors the quality of air across Northern Ireland. 
This includes monitoring pollutants such as particle or particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide. My department has noticed that whilst levels of nitrogen dioxide have remained low since lockdown in 2020, that in lower than in previous years, the levels of particulate matter have varied considerably. For example, on the 9th of April, my department issued an air pollution alert for the following day due to the levels of particulate matter uh, forecasted. The primary sources of particulate matter in Northern Ireland are domestic wood and coal burning and industrial combustion. <coughs> Nitrogen dioxide sources include domestic and industrial combustion and road transport. Air pollution is affected by local topography and weather conditions, and as such, concentrations of pollutions can vary in a relatively short period of time. Therefore, continuous monitoring of air quality is needed to fully assess any real changes and their subsequent impacts. My officials will continue to monitor the data collected, and I encourage everyone to download the new Northern Ireland Air app in order to receive the most up-to-date information on the quality of air across Northern Ireland. I call Paula Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, as a Belfast representative, it has been quite remarkable, the difference, not only in air quality, but also in the sights and sounds of nature around us. And as we see lockdown easing and people returning back to their normal way of life, especially travelling in and out of Belfast, have you had any conversations with the Minister for infra Infrastructure when it comes to people using their own vehicles again, maybe who are afraid um, to use public transport because of social distancing uh, measures? Well, these issues have been discussed at Executive, and certainly there is um, a significant uh, problem going forward with people uh, using public transport because of fears uh, related to COVID-19, which is entirely understandable. Um, the upside um, of all of this is that many people have demonstrated that working from home is something that can actually happen and work extremely well. And I would welcome the fact that you know, many people are currently working from home and working from home very productively. So I would hope that going forward, firms and businesses and indeed government and local government will look at how it can facilitate more people to work from home. That may not mean that somebody works from home five days per week, but it may mean that they work from home two or three days per week. And where you've got a, a good assessment of the volume of work that people are doing, the quality of work that people are doing, and it works, why would you not use that? So I would hope that going forward there will be less pre pressure um, on transportation in general as a consequence of that, but I do recognise that public transport um, has a significant problem going forward in that people are not just going to feel as comfortable um, to just sit down beside an absolute stranger on a bus or a train. Moving on, I call David Hildage. Question six, please. My department has management oversight of over 190 forest parks, country parks and nature reserves, in addition to a large public angling estate across Northern Ireland. Rural amenity sites also comprise lands owned and managed by a number of other organisations, including councils, Northern Ireland Water and environmental organisations. My department can only put measures in place to prevent antisocial behaviour at sites under our direct management. Since the early stages of COVID-19 restrictions, my officials have engaged with the PSNI on an ongoing basis. Where antisocial behaviour becomes apparent at one of the sites my department manages, my officials will, where necessary, request the attendance of the PSNI, who have been very supportive and proactive to date. I would like to express my thanks for their service to this point. The reopening of car parks at rural minty sites coincided with a period of good weather and easing of social restrictions. Unfortunately, antisocial behaviour did occur at a number of sites and beauty spots, in particular large gatherings, consumption of alcohol and littering. Those issues were unfortunately not unique in one area, with issues being reported on a number of beaches in the Mourns and other scenic locations. I would like to convey my disappointment that those who behaved in such an irresponsible manner, both in terms of their lack of adherence to social uh, responsibilities and their disregard for our environment, at this time, many people value the opportunity to go out and enjoy the peace and mental well-being offered by nature, and such selfish behaviour by some ruins the experience for others. The images and videos circulated in social media of antisocial behaviour at some sites such as Crawfordsburn and Helens Bay were of great concern to me, and I am sure my executive colleagues as well. Messaging <coughs> was issued encouraging social and environmental responsibilities. 
during these difficult times, but unfortunately some people are hard to get through to. With over 7.3 million visits per annum to the estate managed by my department, it is unfortunately in invariable that some level of antisocial behaviour will occur periodically. To prevent antisocial behaviour from occurring, my staff monitor sites through regular routine patrols, which in combination with visitor feedback and reports allow for appropriate action to be taken where issues may be arising. Information is fed back to the PSNI as necessary to help target problem sites. I would like to praise my officials for dealing with such issues in circumstances which are often difficult and challenging, and in particular for dealing with large volume of litter left behind and preparing those sites for public use. Thank you. Deputy Speaker, I concur with much of what the Minister has outlined there and the activities that are going on. Uh, the sites have opened up and for good reasons of exercise and, and mental health. They are being well used by, by potentially a new audience. Uh, does the Minister see a way forward to working with other uh, cross departments departments to uh, potentially further develop the amenity sites uh, so that people coming into the area for good use rather than anything else? And we have been engaging with local authorities. And, uh, I was recently up in South Tyrone. Uh, to open a park uh, in that area, and uh, excellent work has been done by the, by the local council. Hillsborough Forest Park, for example, is now the responsibility of the local authority there, and they have spent a lot of money ensuring that the paths are all suitable for people with disabilities and for uh, families with, with children in, in prams and so forth. And that is excellent work. Uh, and we want to do more of that. We want to continue to work with local authorities and others uh, to develop our parks, to develop our great outdoors, and encourage people uh, to go out and enjoy uh, the wonderful facilities and assets that we have here in Northern Ireland. And with most people um, probably not going on holidays this year, um, the staycations um, will be all the more important, and therefore uh, properly monitoring and, and providing um, the appropriate facilities. Uh, for the public to go and enjoy uh, days out uh, will be ever more important. Moving on, I call Sean Lynch. Very short question, Sam. <clears throat> the Environment Fund multi year strategic strand supports the delivery of priority environmental outcomes across Northern Ireland by environmental non government organisations and councils. Funded organisations have always been able to request quarterly payment in advance, where they have identified a need for this. To assist with the impacts of COVID-19, grant uh, recipients were issued with emails in May, reminding them of this option and asking them whether they wish to seek any amendments to their current 2021 Environmental Fund grant. I want to thank the Minister for his answer. Like all groups, Minister, during COVID-19, NGOs have been struggling with cash flow. What other means has the Minister taken to assist environmental NGOs, not just in the current crisis, but, just, uh, but to make financial support more certain going forward? Well, we have 23 organisations funded under the multi-year strategic strand, and they have been offered uh, funding totalling just over £2.2 million in 2021. Additional in-year funding may be offered to these organisations if additional budget becomes available um, later in the year. We also have um, a Capital Environment uh, Challenge Fund competition, uh, and it, um, it is for £650,000. So there is um, close to £3 million of support being offered to these organisations, um, which is of great assistance to them in the work that they do. Moving on, I call Jerry Kelly. Uh, uh, question here, please. The environmental Bill, alongside existing environmental le legislation, provides a basis for continued environmental protection and improvement in Northern Ireland, making such protection temporary or contingent upon something that the Assembly may or may not agree at an unspecified point in the future, in the challenges and circumstances we face at the moment, I believe is not the best way to safeguard the environment. I appreciate that some people may have proposals which differ from what is in the Bill, and if these are put forward, I will be happy to consider them in the future, and the Assembly will be free to make whatever changes it sees fit. However, if the Bill does not go forward, the result will be a loss of existing environmental safeguards. Call Jerry Kelly for supplementary. 
Going away, just listen there, uh, listen Fraggish, and I thank the minister for his uh, question. There, and he may have uh, gone into what I was going to ask him in any case. Um, will the minister then uh, commit to bring forward a, uh, an assemb- to the assembly an environment bill which will build on the protections, the environmental protections already already there? Well, the, the first issue is to get the current environment bill through and, and, and secure environmental protections. Thereafter, um, it is either for myself or indeed a member of the Assembly to bring forward uh, further legislation as and when required, um, which can enhance um, our support for having good environmental practice in Northern Ireland. Michael Dolores Kelly. A question, nine Minister. The Northern Ireland Environmental Agency has 413 reportable active investigations into alleged environmental offending, and these cases are all at various stages of consideration and cover purported criminality in terms of waste, water, and the natural environment. Call to Lewis Kelly for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. Minister, in terms of those, um, how many of those do you think will actually meet the test for prosecution, and if and when prosecuted, uh, do, do you believe that the punishment fits the crime and serves as an exemplar to others not to uh, to indulge in this behaviour? Well, there is a series of means of, of dealing uh, with cases, and some of those will involve um, warning letters. Some of them will involve. Um, fines automatically uh, from NIEA. Um, some will involve um, actually seizing property and, 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 and seizing equipment and so forth. Um, and the, uh, there's obviously um, the issues that go to court. Uh, when NIEA takes someone to court, uh, they always seek to recover costs. And the fine is a matter for the, 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 the judge who's sitting on that particular day. And we encourage uh, the judges uh, to implement fines which reflect um, the, the, the nature of the event. And very often the public do not believe that that is the case. Um, but that is a matter for the judiciary. Moving on, I call William Irwin. Question number 10, Mr. Deputy Speaker. While agriculture is currently the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the Northern Ireland inventory, the farmed landscape also contains important sinks for carbon in soils, peatlands, forestry, hedgerows and farm trees. The ability of our farmed landscape to sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store carbon in soils and vegetation places farms, farmers as our primary land managers at the forefront of efforts to offset local GHG emissions and contribute to UK net zero by 2050 ambition. Alongside their vital role in producing nutritious food, I also recognise that farmers can play a crucial role in further enhancing carbon stocks by proactively adopting practices that conserve our pastures and increase farm woodland and hedgerows, maintaining and restoring our peatlands, and only applying nutrients uh, that meet the crop's need. My department will continue to assist farmers adopt low-carbon farming practices through scientific research, knowledge transfer and farm support schemes. Among the body of scientific research work is to more accurately account for the amount of carbon stored and sequestered in our grassland soils. Emerging evidence indicates that managed grasslands continue to sequester carbon after 47 years, and sequestration rates are enhanced where cattle slurry is applied, which is a common practice in farms in Northern Ireland. CAFRI is delivering advice to farmers through various channels including the new Environmental Business Development Group programme, which focuses on sustainable farm systems and helps farmers identify carbon reduction measures and how to increase farm carbon and sequestration. Forest Service is leading on Forest for a Future, aiming to create 9,000 hectares of new woodland by 2030, and plan to open a new standalone small woodland grant scheme to help farmers integrate woodland on their farms. Also, the Environmental Farming Scheme supports carbon-friendly practices, including maintaining and establishing native woodland, hedgerows, agroforestry and peatland restoration. I am confident that farmers will continue to participate positively in these initiatives and help put sustainability at the heart of our living, working, active landscape. I call William Irwin for supplement. Can I thank the Minister for his response? I am sure the Minister would agree with me that farmers work tirelessly to improve the environment that we have. I think there are uh, many opportunities um, which farmers are um, applying themselves to. 
and we need to continue to work to ensure uh, that we can continue to improve um, farm practices. That is something that has changed dramatically um, over the last 40 years, and I believe that um, there will be significant changes going forward. Uh, but I do believe that the farming community are up for those changes. Moving on, I call Karen Mullen. Question number 11. The Environmental Fund's strategic strand supports the delivery of priority environmental outcomes across Northern Ireland. The strategic strand is a three- to four-year programme, which began in 2019-20, and its scope cannot be widened. Additional Environmental Fund Challenge uh, Fund competitions may be operated throughout the year to support environmental priorities being delivered by not-for-profit organisations and councils. I call Karen Mullen. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, Minister, environmental NGOs have found it difficult to make ends meet during this period, like all our charities and NGOs. They have lost income from donations in all our areas. Will the Minister tailor support to meet the needs of NGOs of different sizes and types? Yes, we have been engaging with the environmental NGO sector and recognise that they are facing challenges um, as a consequence of COVID-19 and loss of income, along with staff and volunteer shortages as well. Uh, so, in terms of um, that engagement, and we have also engaged with all the Northern Ireland government departments and UK administrations to understand the, the wider impact of COVID-19 um, on the environmental sector. The sector are making considerable use of general COVID funding provisions, especially the furloughed arrangement, and the Department has um, commented on the proposed charity fund. The Department currently is not considering a COVID fund in addition to the current provisions, but this will be kept under review throughout the year. Members, again, we are ahead of schedule, and it is my intention to take supplementaries for remaining questions, if anyone wishes to indicate. I now call Chris Little. Question number 12. At the outset, I'd like to assure you that I share and appreciate your concerns at this difficult time. In response to you and from the outset of this crisis, my officials have coordinated and facilitated regular, often daily, meetings between the relevant representative industry bodies, so uh, individuals, FBOs, Health and Safety Executive Northern Ireland, HSENI, the Food Standards Agency Northern Ireland, and the Public Health Agency. This uh, principal uh, objective of these meetings and associated communications to ensure the industry as a whole and the individual FBOs in particular are familiar with implementing the latest PHA guidance, which is primarily aimed <coughs> at ensuring a safe working environment for all personnel and minimising the risk of COVID transmission in the workplace. I call Chris Little for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his update. I'm sure he will agree that the agri-food sector is a, an essential and a proudly diverse workforce. So, can the minister assure the assembly that COVID-19 infection prevention and control guidance is being made available to agri-food food workplaces in multilingual format, and that all workplaces are being supported to provide adequate PPE to our agri-food sector key workers? Well, the food business operators have been working with um, a wide number of, of, of uh, groups of people um, from various ethnic backgrounds um, who have chosen to come and work here uh, and have, are quite expert in, in, in their uh, means of communication with them. Uh, so, actual communication is uh, not so much of a problem. Um, sometimes some of the attention to communication can be more of a problem. Uh, many people are sharing transport. Um, they are sharing the same households. Um, so, leaving aside what is happening in the workplace, there are consequences both from where the people live and them travelling to and from the work. That said, uh, the levels of um, absenteeism in the workforce are incredibly low. Uh, the public sector would be really delighted if they could get to those levels um, of what the private sector workforce in these situations have actually achieved uh, in the midst of a pandemic. I call Kelly Armstrong for supplementary. Speaker, um, just to follow up with the minister on that, is the minister absolutely convinced that there will be enough PPE made available to our agri-food producers to ensure that those staff members will be kept safe, and of course that our food chain will be kept safe? 
Well, agri-food has, has tended to be ahead of the game and, and has normally been using um, PPE. Um, they have also obviously have had to introduce additional PPE, which is a challenge at this time for every organisation. Um, but the businesses are, 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 are quite versatile. I should say that they are complaining about how much they have had to spend, and we would like some government support for that. Um, it is not for my government department to do that. They come under DETI, or DFE now, um, <clears throat> and that is a matter for DFE to consider. Uh, but certainly keeping those people safe, they account for 32 per cent of our manufacturing output in Northern Ireland. They have kept food on the tables um, right across Northern Ireland and, and indeed um, across Great Britain. And their work has been absolutely key, and I think that we should uh, be very proud of what has been achieved um, by pe those people, the ordinary working people um, in the agri-food sector, and greatly appreciate all of them, wherever they have come from, in terms of um, doing that work, uh, which is, quite frankly, work that a lot of people in Northern Ireland turn their nose up at. So I greatly appreciate the fact that they do that job. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, thank the Minister for his uh, answers thus far. And, and turning to, to food production in response to COVID-19 and indeed working people, will he reconsider his decision not to uh, assist Loch Naid Fisheries? Uh, and those who work on the lock for lock naive fisheries uh, in response to the COVID-19. Many sectors have received financial support, but this is one sector that hasn't. Excuse me the question. The, the, the original question, but nonetheless, I'm happy to answer it. Um, I, haven't, I haven't made any such decision not to, to fund them. Um, we were waiting to see, um, and as a, the, they really only get going um, in June, June, from the end of May onwards, uh, in terms of their fishing, um, to assess what the markets are, um, we're beginning to, to get a better feel for it. And I know that the member has requested a meeting with myself, and I'm very happy to, to, to do that and to hear all of the arguments. But no decision has been made. I cannot call Sinead Bradley for supplementary. The Minister for his comments, um, and to those individuals in the food sector who have supplied. Um, food throughout this COVID-19, but is the Minister aware and concerned that there are still at this late stage many businesses and support businesses that sit outside the business support scheme and they are genuinely still struggling today? Well, again, the remit for that falls outside of my department and it is something that I have received communication from, from uh, you know, uh, uh, as, as an MLA and recognise that uh, it is extremely difficult um, to be able to spread something uh, which targets every group uh, and every business in Northern Ireland. And it's hugely unfortunate that some businesses have fallen out. I should say that there has been £410 million pounds put into the business economies um, across Northern Ireland. And I think that that will make a difference between an awful lot of businesses going under and businesses getting to the other side of COVID-19. So, whilst I agree with her on one hand, I also recognise that a massive amount of work has been done in support of business across Northern Ireland. Moving on, I call Steve A. Question number 13, please. My department is currently scoping and implementing a cross-cutting programme of work as follows, understanding the processes required to reduce friction and trade as far as it is possible while meeting the legal requirements of our statutory rule, which is to carry out sanitary and phytosanitary checks at the point of entry. Understanding the IT requirements, this will facilitate movement of trade while seeking to minimise the impact on traders. Understanding the minimum requirements for each of the designated or potentially designated points of entry to Northern Ireland that will meet EU specifications. My officials have commenced engagement with a range of key stakeholders to ensure appropriate measures are in place to facilitate the movement of goods and products between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, whilst complying with the statutory requirements of the Northern Ireland Protocol. To date, this has included engagement with Lauren Belfast and Warren Point Ports and their key users, in conjunction with their representatives from the relevant local councils, HMRC, Border Force, Food Standards Agency and other relevant Northern Ireland government departments. Meetings are also being planned with Northern Ireland's airport and foil port. I have been clear that I wish to implement the Northern Ireland Protocol in a way that maximises the flow of trade and what works for Northern Ireland's business and its citizens. Call Steve Aiken for supplementary. May I thank the Minister for his uh, comments so far? 
I would just wonder whether the Minister could explain, in the absence of any detail on costs, explanation on declarations, or any other information within Article 5.2 of the Protocol, which, as you are well aware, is namely deciding and establishing the criteria under which goods moving into Northern Ireland from GB or from outside the EU will be considered at risk of subsequently being moved into the Union. How, in his own words, that can he be so positive that Brexit deal could bring advantages to Northern Ireland, giving access to both the UK market and the EU single market, when everybody else can't see it? Well, uh, in terms of this um, particular issue, uh, first of all, um, he quite clearly, or he quite, quite rightly quotes um, the, the relevant paragraph, which indicates the issue about goods which are at risk of entering uh, the EU market. So those goods that are clearly coming to stay in Northern Ireland, um, the, 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 the trucks and the many trucks that are bringing in um, vital goods uh, which are being used in our shops and our supermarkets should not be considered in any way, shape or form of goods at risk. So consequently, we deal with that one. There is a series of other goods um, which can easily be identified as staying in Northern Ireland and trusted traders and all of that there needs to be kicked in. And it was on the basis of, of, of this, because we, we had made no progress on this issue for a number of months, because the UK government hadn't given us um, the details that was required, but they did a number of weeks ago. And consequently, we have um, mo started to move forward on the back of that. Uh, but that has given us a degree of latitude. Um, and a degree of confidence that we can deal better with the goods that are coming from GB to Northern Ireland. I don't like this protocol. Everybody knows that I don't like this protocol, but nonetheless, it is something uh, that is a, a binding international agreement that was made by our government and the European Union. And we are subservient to the Westminster government on this issue. Therefore, we have to take actions to ensure that food that is imported to Northern Ireland is not imported through Dublin from the 1st of January next year. Therefore, we are taking steps which need to be take, taken. On the issue of the benefits, access to both the, the GB market and the single market, I believe, will be quite clearly a benefit um, to any inward investor coming to Northern Ireland, um, particularly unfettered access. And therefore, any issue about export health certificates needs to be obliterated in these negotiations if it is to work well. Call your Minister for supplement. Unambiguously in the records of this House in terms of answering questions. Since the protocol became law, in saying this, and I quote, I have no intention of facilitating infrastructure at Northern Ireland ports. No intention. Is that still his position? And if not, why has he moved from that position? Well, the position is very clear in terms of how we can move forward. And the absence of having anything at the ports um, as, a, as a result of the protocol will actually lead to a situation where Northern Ireland's goods would all have to be imported um, through the Republic of Ireland, which I'm sure the member wouldn't want and wouldn't find desirable. I'd also point out um, to the member the frailty of his own position that he has adopted um, from the outset, and that was to put all of his faith and all of his trust and everything into the hands of the Westminster government as opposed to a devolved administration that he constantly rails against. And this is the consequence. This is a consequence, Mr Deputy Speaker, of actually Westminster dealing exclusively with these issues and not having a Northern Ireland Assembly. And Mr Allister should reflect upon that, whether it's order, in this issue order. or whether it's an abortion or other issues that he shouts a lot about, but he's put his power into the hands of others who care less about the issues than we actually do. I call Sean Link. Order. I call Sean Lynch for supplementary. Uh, last time call you. Could I ask the Minister, has he got any clarity from the British Treasury that they will cover the cost of additional infrastructure required at our ports to carry out SPS checks? Gormagut. The answer is no, um, but the request has been put in, and uh, we will be working very hard 
uh, to ensure that we do get funding uh, to support this. This is not something that has came about as a consequence of anything that Northern Ireland has done. It is something that has come about as an imposition upon Northern Ireland, and therefore we need to um, argue this case very strongly. Then you all, I call Catherine Kelly. Question 14. Since the Northern Ireland Executive announced the allocation of the 25 million COVID-19 support package, I have invited views and sought input from a range of industry representatives and stakeholders. On May 22, I spoke to the ERA committee and invited their views on how best to allocate funding to the those most affected. I have received their views. <coughs> I have received independent analysis, reports and industry proposals. And I have met with representatives of the dairy sector, red meat sector and farming unions to hear their proposals for allocating this funding. During these discussions, there was a clear acceptance of the need for support to be targeted at those farm businesses hardest hit financially as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, I have received numerous emails and letters from political representatives, farmers, businesses, rural groups and organisations representing farmers' interests requesting support for a range of sectors, including dairy, beef, ornamental horticulture, sheep, wool, hill farming, potatoes and poultry breeding egg producers. I am carefully consider all of those views and opinions and will make my decision on how best to allocate this funding in a fair and equitable way based on evidence in the near future. I call Catherine Kelly for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. You will be aware that many sectors have been affected by the COVID crisis, including our sheep and beef primary producers. Can you give assurances that these sectors will be included when allocating the £25 million funding? I am happy to support any sector that can provide evidence of um, COVID-19 having a financially detrimental impact upon their businesses. Uh, some it is very clear-cut, some it is not so clear-cut, but I am very happy um, to look at all of the evidence that is provided to me and, as I say, arrive in a fair and equitable way um, to allocate it thereafter. I call Rosemary Barton for supplementary. Thank you, Minister. So far for your answers. Thank you. Minister, you will be aware that the market for the wool harvest has collapsed since COVID has taken place. And you will be aware now that the cost for harvesting the wool is actually more than the farmers get for the wool. Have you any, anything in mind to support that? Well, I am aware of that. Um, fleeces, I think last year, were making around two pounds um, a fleece. Uh, was covered the cost of, of the clipping. There isn't much money to be made from sheep farmers from wool anymore, unfortunately. Um, but this year, there really isn't a market for it. Um, so I think um, some of the companies are, are taking wool um, on the basis that, that they will, they will uh, if, if they get it sold at some margin, then they will provide a payment to the farmer. But at this, at this stage, they don't have that. So it is something that I'm reflecting upon. I call Jim Wells for supplementary. There is a perception, Minister, that the beef and dairy sector are all powerful within the farming lobby and the quickest to catch his ear. Could I draw his attention to the plight of the potato sector, where uh, lots of the produce has been sold as feed, animal feed, rather than to restaurants and supermarkets? Would he bear in mind the need of that sector when it comes to allocating his very welcome £25 million funding? Well, it's good to see the member <coughs> speaking on behalf of farmers who grow vegetables, and uh, that's, that's, that's something which is close to his heart. But nonetheless, um, yes, of course we will. Uh, it's an area that, that I don't think it's quite a relatively small number of farmers who have been called out this way. So the farmers who have the potato farmers who have been packing potatoes for, for the retail outlets um, have been doing quite well in terms of the volumes that they have been getting out, and, and most of their potatoes are gone. Uh, but obviously those who were supplying that all important um, 40 per cent uh, of, of food um, through the hospitality sector um, have been affected, and that's an area that we will be uh, looking at. All our list of questions uh, are, are, have been asked, and our time is up. Point, point of order. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, while I was fortunate enough to be called twice in the unscheduled um, supplementary questions, would it be in order to place on record the observation that apart from the last five minutes of each of these question times, they largely were ineffective 
because whereas there may have been an exercise in shielding the ministers and may have worked for them, as far as this House goes, in regard to sustained focused questioning, which often comes from a succession of questions on a particular topic, they were largely ineffective and ill-served the scrutiny function of this House. So could you take it back to the Speaker's office, as far as I'm concerned, uh, and to the Business Committee, that why are we doing this when we've got a proven system of question time with topical questions, which is far more effective? The member has put his point on the record, and I'm sure everyone will be reflecting upon it. And he was called twice on this particular occasion. I don't know if he's criticising himself. himself, himself. Uh, but as has, as has been said, as has been said uh, this is a new procedure, and it will be reviewed uh, depending on how everyone feels about it. So uh, I would ask everyone to feed their views back through uh, the, the business committee uh, so in, in, in future uh, we can determine what we think works best. Further point of order. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's become a regular occurrence now that we're having point of orders, which appear to me anyhow as not being point of orders. There are more statements. Uh, and if Mr Allister's questioning is ineffective, that's nothing to do with the rest of the members. Uh, but it certainly, in my opinion, borders on whether it's a point of order or not. Uh, the member, too, has got his point on the record, and ultimately it's up to myself as Deputy Speaker to determine whether or not something is a per point of order and needs reflected upon. Question time is over. I'd ask members to take their ease for a few moments. And then we will be so sh shortly be continuing with the executive business, where the next item is on the order papers the Health Protections Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Number Four.